Brown, uh, who has always really been a role model for me. And I think if she had the opportunities that she and my dad provided for me, she'd have ruled the world. There is no question in my mind. But thank you so much, Deborah. Thank you for the wonderful inf introduction and for inviting me to this luncheon. It is always such a special occasion. And it's always an amazing crowd of folks uh, uh, who are here. You have, you know how to get them out. It's so great. It's wonderful. And there's so many people here today uh, to support the partnership. And it is a testament to the importance of your work and of the transformative impact that you have had. You have led the fight for women and families since 1971. You are the tip of the spear. And as the Women's Legal Defense Fund, you won the legal battles that reformed our national child support system. You discouraged sexual harassment, and you ended the discrimination against pregnant mothers in the workforce. You wrote the Family and Medical Leave Act. 100 million stories flow from your work. You are the vanguard of our push for the common sense policies that will make a profound difference for women and families. And one reason you are so effective in these debates is because of Deborah and because of Judy. Deborah has given her vision and her passion to the partnership since 1991 and testified many times before Congress on sick leave, on health care, on pay equity. She is dedicated to the fight for social justice. And everyone at the partnership goes the extra mile for our families. You are champions, and we all know that Judy is a treasure. <laughs> I thank you so much for honoring me. I am humbled by your recognition, and I take it as a call to continue trying to make a difference in people's lives and fighting even harder for families. I also want to recognize today's other honorees, and they're flying back from Capitol Hill because we just finished voting. My dear, dear friends, Gwen Moore and Tammy Duckworth. And Tammy just offered the motion to recommit on the floor on uh, preventing sexual harassment and of women in the military. It was, it was wonderful. She's wonderful. You have to know what a privilege it is for me to serve and to fight alongside of both of my colleagues. As I said, Family and Medical Leave Act began here. The partnership drafted the first version of the bill, organized a broad coalition to support it, and leaders from both sides of the aisle answered the call. Pat Schroeder, Connie Morella, Members understood the changing needs of working families, and they made M FMLA happen. I have always been proud that my state of Connecticut passed the first Family and Medical Leave Act in 1989. And in 1986, my then boss, Chris Dodd, authored and introduced FMLA in the United States Senate. I can tell you that he wrote the bill, he lived it, and he practiced it. Some of you have heard this story before, but it always is important for me to tell it again. The day Senator Dodd announced that he was running for re-election to the United States Senate, I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. I made it through that day. To this day, I don't know how Stan and I made it through that day, but we did. And two days later, I went to see the senator, and I told him about the diagnosis and that I was going to be into the hospital in the next couple of days. And he said to me very clearly, he said, Rosa, you are my chief of staff, you are my campaign manager, nothing changes, go and get yourself well. 
go and get yourself well. So the policy is very, very personal for me. Chris Dodd gave me the time I needed to get well. And that should be for everyone in this nation, not for a select few. And because we worked together, kept pushing, and did not give up, the FMLA became law in 1993. This was a watershed. It was the first public policy initiative in our history to reflect the changing nature of working families, the way families live today. And since then, workers have used family and medical leave over 100 million times to care for their newborn children, to care for sick or injured family members, or just to get better themselves. And because we acted, our workplaces are more family-friendly, productive, and efficient today. But we still have work to do. FMLA is unpaid leave, and eight out of 10 eligible workers cannot afford to take it. Women still make up almost two-thirds of this number. So our fight is not over. We have more to do. We need to modernize, expand FMLA. We need to pass paid sick leave because being a working parent should not mean having to choose between your job and taking care of yourself and your family. And it is time that our public policy reflect the way that we live in the 21st century with both parents in the workforce. And families are headed by single women in the workforce. We need to recognize this and we need need to create the policies to affect it. Today, 86% of Americans support paid sick day legislation, and for a good reason. They protect the public health, they boost the economy, they encourage productivity, and they help employees balance work and family. I'm glad to say Connecticut is once again leading the way forward. My state passed the first in the nation state paid sick days law in 2011, and I hope like the FMLA, we can take this law national. There, yes, yes, you're here. There is so much we can do to help make this economy work for families. We need to put teeth into the Equal Pay Act, now 50 years old, by seeing the Paycheck Fairness Act become law. We need to expand access to child care and the child tax credit. But you know, today, let us take a moment let us reflect on how far we have come. Because we worked hard, we worked together, there are 100 million stories of families united in trying times after an illness or injury. Parents there for their children and children there for their parents. I know that pushing the Congress to do right can be a frustrating experience. But always remember that Congress is the institution with the power to bring profound and positive change. It listens to those who raise their voices. And in this day and age, women increasingly drive the electoral and the policy agenda. And if we keep pushing together in partnership, I know that we can continue to make women and families' lives less economically insecure than they are today. We can help write another 100 million stories. We can make a difference that matters. That is our charge. That is what we will do. Come on, girls and men, let's make our voices heard. God bless you. Thank you so very, very much for listening to me today. Thank you.